Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Weekly Reads, where we give you five book recommendations all in one show. My name is Devin. I'm a librarian at the Worcester Public Library, just like my co-host Joy. Joy, I have some bad news for you. Oh, and what would that be? I read a lot of romance books this weekend, so... No! <laughs> <laughs> gonna get lots of romance reviews in the upcoming oh week. <laughs> no okay i'll endure it you endure my nonfiction. i'll endure your romance sounds like a plan <laughs> <laughs> so most of the stuff we're talking about today you can get online through the overdrive or libby app for free with your library card you can also use uh overdrive on your browser on your laptop or desktop we're also talking about hoopla which is also a free app and we're doing physical pickup of items. So if you want a print book or a book on CD or whatever, uh, you can call ahead and arrange that. If you're not sure how to do any of that, just call us or you can leave a message below in the comments and we'll help you out. So now I'm going to switch screens so you can see the books we have lined up for you this week. Okay, as usual, I'm going to do the fiction. Joy will do the nonfiction and we have our coming soon title. Okay, so for our first book, I chose Pew, uh, which just came out this summer in July. When it came out, it was considered one of the best books to read of the season by the Wall Street Journal, Esquire, and the Financial Times. It's also one of the most anticipated books of the whole year, according to Vogue and BuzzFeed. In an unnamed town in the South, a congregation arrives for church service and finds someone asleep on a pew. The person seems genderless, racially ambiguous, and refuses to speak. One family takes them in and nicknames them Pew. As everyone prepares for the Forgiveness Festival, Pew is moved from house to house, and the townspeople see different identities in Pew. Many confess their fears and secrets in one-sided conversations, and Pew listens. As days pass, Pew's presence begins to unnerve the community, whose generosity turns into menace and suspicion. When Pew's story reaches an unsettling climax at the Forgiveness Festival, the secret of who they really are, a devil, an angel, or something else, is dwarfed by larger truths. A reviewer at the Wall Street Journal called the book marvelously elusive. They said, I've thought about characterizing it as a work of Southern Gothic in the vein of Flannery O'Connor, as a political religious fable reminiscent of Margaret Atwood, as a Shirley Jackson-esque piece of small town horror, and even as a sly update on Mark Twain's great story, The Mysterious Stranger. But like its title character, this novel resists definition. So I think this book has a lot going for it. It was highly anticipated. It's got great reviews. And I like that it's being compared to so many classic authors. So if those are the sorts of things that you like, this is definitely a book that you would want to check out. And here's one from Joy. Oh my goodness, Flannery O'Connor and Shirley Jackson, right up my alley. Yeah, me too. Well, my first choice for this week is a classic work of American literature, Walden by Henry David Thoreau, which we read for our American history book discussion this past Tuesday. As usual, we had a very lively conversation. I never wanted a cell phone. And I certainly never wanted a cell phone with data. Do I really need instant and incessant access to news that invariably makes me sad, anxious, or lazy? Why would I want to be available to anyone and everyone 24 hours a day? I didn't. I don't. Still, after years of passive resistance, the world talked me into needing a cell phone. Yes, with data. Wait a minute, you may well ask. What does any of this have to do with Walden? Well, quite a lot, actually. In Thoreau's day, technology meant railroads, which enabled riders to go from Concord to, say, Fitchburg at the unheard of speed of 30 miles an hour. And then there was the telegraph. But Thoreau asks, do we really need to travel to Fitchburg or anywhere else at 30 miles an hour? 
And just because we can tunnel under the Atlantic and bring news of the old world to the new, do we really have anything worth communicating? It is at this point, across a gap of 170 years, that the curmudgeon in Henry David Thoreau speaks to the curmudgeon in me. Thoreau, however, was not opposed to technology out of sheer stubborn conservatism. In many ways, he was a political radical, willing to go to jail if only for one day, rather than pay taxes to a government that supported slavery and what he believed to be unjust wars, and celebrating the energy of youth against the wisdom of age. In Walden, Thoreau urges his readers to ask the question, what do we really need in order to live well? How do we move beyond lives lived in quiet desperation and find meaning and purpose and joy? His answer, simplify, simplify, simplify. Get rid of the noise, whether that means a ringtone or the whistle of a passing train and truly hear the voice of the divinity that he and his fellow transcendentalists believe pervades all of nature. It is for this reason that Thoreau built a one-room cabin on the shores of Walden Pond, one mile away from the town of Concord where he lived as simply as possible for two years. Then wrote to us in words that echo across the generations. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. As Thoreau himself would have said, sublime. That is a very well-written book that I keep meaning to read. Well worth it. Sounds it. All right, and here's my next one. Boyfriend material. This book also came out this summer in July. This is not one of the romances I read this weekend, but the coworker who recommends it said it is a very fun rom-com. It's an LGBTQ romance about exact opposites falling in perfectly imperfect love. Luke is famous. His rock star parents split when he was young and his father that he's never met spent time in rehab, but now his dad's making a comeback putting Luke back in the public eye. To clean up his image, Luke has to find a nice, normal relationship, and Oliver is as nice and normal as they come. He's a barrister, a vegetarian, and he's never inspired one moment of scandal. Unfortunately, apart from being gay, single, and in need of a date for a big event, Luke and Oliver have nothing in common. So they strike a deal to be fake boyfriends in public until the dust has settled. Then they can go their separate ways and pretend it never happened. But the thing about fake dating is that it can feel a lot like real dating. And that's when you start to fall for somebody. This book got a starred review from Publishers Weekly. It got a lot of good feedback from different authors. The author Christina Loren said the book is hilarious, witty, tender, and stunning. I really like this next comment from author Chris Ripper, who said, boyfriend material perfectly balances laugh out loud while reading alone in an empty room with, those aren't tears in my eyes, just allergies. <laughs> Which happens to me every time I read a romance book. So if you're in the same boat as me, this probably would be a good one to try. Here's another one from Joy. My second choice this week, Marmy and Louisa, The Untold Life of Louisa May Alcott and Her Mother, is set in the same place, time period, and cultural milieu as that which nurtured the genius of Henry David Thoreau. In fact, Thoreau was very close to the Alcott family, attending the wedding of Louisa's, Louisa's older sister, Anna, and serving as pallbearer for her younger sister, Elizabeth. Generally, I make my weekly selections from across the nonfiction spectrum, pairing science with sports, for example, or crime with spirituality. 
However, in this case, I really wanted to know more about Thoreau's world, this time from a woman's perspective. And so a narrow focus, the mid 19th century transcendentalists of Concord, Massachusetts, it is. Next week, rock and roll and dinosaurs and dangerous cults, I promise. Mm -hmm. That'll be. You may think you already know all there is to know about Louisa May Alcott and her mother. After all, over time, millions of people worldwide have read Little Women in a multitude of languages, or at least seen one of the many film adaptations of the work, which for decades following its publication remained the best-selling novel by any American writer, male or female. Generations of women have identified with Joe, admired Amy's golden curls, mourned Beth, and crushed on Lloyd. However, if you open this book expecting to find a heartwarming tale of four plucky sisters and their wise, infinitely patient marmee ensconced in a humble cottage in genteel poverty, you may be dismayed. In real life, Abigail Alcott and her daughters endured grinding poverty, alleviated only by the charity of wealthier friends and family members. By the time they reached adulthood and the Alcotts found some degree of stability at Orchard House, Louisa and her siblings had lived in over 30 rented or borrowed residences, including a failed commune. Abigail was a committed abolitionist and advocate for women's rights, who entered into her marriage with great hope and faith in the values she shared with her starry-eyed husband, philosopher Bronson Alcott. She would be bitterly disappointed. And author Eve LaPlante lays the blame squarely on Bronson, who never made more than a half-hearted attempt or two to support his wife and daughters and throughout his life demonstrated truly appalling selfishness. Through it all, however, Abigail was a devoted and inspiring mother, encouraging her girls to exercise their own talents and follow their dreams, providing writing implements and notebooks to Louisa and art supplies to her youngest daughter, May, who as an adult moved to Europe and became a successful painter. When Louisa was in her mid-twenties, she determined that she would never marry. She had seen too much marital discord for that. And since her father wouldn't support the family, and her mother, then in declining health, could not, she, Louisa, would. And she wouldn't do it by taking in laundry or teaching or nursing, all of which she had tried at one point or another. She would do it by writing. Obviously, she succeeded beyond her wildest dreams. Louisa's fame made her family rich. Abigail Alcott remained Louisa's closest friend and mentor throughout their lives. Little Women is above all else a daughter's tribute to her beloved Mermy. I had no idea that the father was so terrible. That's really surprising. Oh, he's an infuriating individual. Uh, I can't imagine. All right, here's our coming soon title for the week. This book is coming out on September 15th, which is Tuesday. Akhtar is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer and the famous author Salman Rushdie said that this book of his is passionate, disturbing, and unputdownable. This book blends fact and fiction to offer a portrait of a Muslim Pakistani family in Wisconsin during the years between the Iran hostage crisis and Trump's presidency. The father is a cardiologist who becomes Donald Trump's heart specialist and falls under Trump's spell, oh getting his suits from Trump's favorite tailor and running after the same woman Trump chased. America never grows on the mother and her first love returns to Pakistan to support the Afghan war against the Soviets. Then there's the author's alter ego, also named Akhtar. With his Ivy League education, prestigious award, and plenty of stocks, he's become the American winner that every immigrant parent wants, 
but he is unable to save those to whom his success might mean the most. Booklist said the author confronts issues of race, money, family, politics, and sexuality in this bold memoiristic tale using an array of fascinating characters with different insights into America. So I really like all the different um, aspects and viewpoints of America that this book seems to offer. And I think getting an endorsement from Salman Rushdie is a big deal. My cat agrees. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a print copy of this book um, processing in the catalog, which you can place a hold on for when it's released. And hopefully it will soon be in Overdrive and Libby as well. But that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Don't forget that if there's a recommendation you'd like or a similar author you're looking for, just leave a comment below and join and I'll see what we can do. Otherwise, thanks for watching and we hope to see you next time. I knew we'd get a cat in there somewhere. See you later, fellow readers.